All right, so we've been talking about being transformed into the image of Christ. We've looked at the, uh, the predicament. We've looked at the power. We've looked at the possibilities of transformation. And now tonight, with the Lord's help, we want to look at what I've entitled, it's up there, the preeminence in a transformed life. And we talked, we kind of ended this afternoon, this morning, we ended with this idea of who is preeminent in our life. It's interesting, this word preeminence uh, only is mentioned twice in all of the New Testament. It's mentioned once that in, that Christ may have the preeminent place, that in all things he might be preeminent. And then the second place where it's used is in, I believe it's in 3 John, where there was a man named Diotrephes, and he desired to have the preeminent place. In other words, he wanted Christ's place. And he wanted Christ moved out of the way, and he wanted to have Christ's position. But what the scriptures teach us, what the Holy Spirit would point us to, and what God the Father would desire is that Christ would have the preeminent place in our life. And when we end tonight, we're going to be looking at two individuals. At the end of this this, uh, session, we want to look at two individuals in whose life Christ indeed was preeminent. And it's evident, and it's obvious. In fact, it's even obvious that as you look at these two, two individuals, that their lives were transformed, that they were like Christ. They didn't have to wait till they got to heaven to be like Christ. In their life, they were like Christ. So we'll come to them in a moment. But as we consider then this this manner of being transformed and having it to be the preeminent place in our life, I have a question to ask us. And that is, who do you look like? If you look at this little kitty cat in the mirror, the kitty cat looks in the mirror, it's just a little bitty kitty cat, but it looks in the mirror and it sees a lion. It's being transformed. It looks like a lion. I asked my wife, I'll just, disclaimer here, I asked my wife, do you think this is a good slide? She says, oh, I like the kitty. I said, what about the lion? Well, I like the lion too, but the kitty's cute. That's Aunt Shelley, right? For those of you that know her. But I, use, I want to use this to say, who do you look like? If your friends at school, for those of you that are at college or high school, do they look at you and see Christ? We are challenged by so many things in life. And young people, you are bombarded, maybe more than we were when we were your age. It wasn't that long ago might seem like forever for some of us, but I don't know why I looked at you, Sergio, sorry. But every one of us, even the adults in this room, are bombarded and we are challenged and we are at a place in life, we come to a place in life often where we are even challenged to compromise what we believe. And this is what we want to talk about tonight a little bit. Uh, you know, there are people in the Bible, throughout the Bible, who, were, who compromised. In fact, there's one man I'm thinking of right now who compromised, and his uncle said, listen, you, you look in whatever you want, you look this way and you look that way, and you look in front, you look all around, and whatever land you want, that'll be your land, and I'll take whatever's left. And that's what Abraham did. Abraham Abraham let Lot choose. And what do we find about Lot? Lot, in Scripture, we find that Lot, uh, he, he, he said, well, this land looks good. This land over here looks really good toward Sodom and Gomorrah. I think I'll pick that land because that looks more fruitful. Not realize, realizing that he serves the living God who can provide, who's no man's debtor, who, who, if you trust him, he will provide for your every need. But Lot chooses the land that looked good to the eyes. 
and he moved toward Sodom and Gomorrah. Make a long story short with Lot, what we find is that pretty soon Lot not only pitched his tents toward there, he pitched his tents outside, and the next thing you know, Lot is sitting in the gates, meaning that he became a part of the city council, meaning that he became a very important person in that city. So much so that even when the angels came, uh, the, the angels came to warn Lot, and what we find is that Lot had to protect those messengers from the, the townspeople, and Lot was in the midst of wickedness all around him because he compromised, and he kept moving closer and closer and closer. He compromised. And let me tell you something. When you compromise one principle from Scripture, the next principle from Scripture becomes easier to compromise. And when you give in in that area, it becomes even easier the next time around. You know, the thing about Lot, we wouldn't even know Lot was a Christian, using that New Testament word. We wouldn't even, and when we read his story in the Old Testament, we wouldn't even believe that he was a Christian. Unless we read in Peter, where it says, Peter, he vexed his righteous soul. He knew the compromises he had made. He knew that he was making compromises all along the way. So when we think about this, he vexed his own righteous soul. A lot. So how is it that you and I can keep for making these compromises in our lives. That's what we want to look at a little bit here. I've got this verse up here. It's one of the other places where uh, transformation is mentioned in Scripture. Remember, at the outset of our time together, uh, we said it's mentioned four times in Scripture, uh, twice concerning the Lord Jesus in Matthew 17 and in Mark chapter 9, and then twice in connection to our lives. We saw in, in uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. We'll come back to those verses, but we had those before us. And now we want to look at this verse. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding us in the mirror, the glory of the Lord. And we are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So when we think about this verse... What I'd like to do right now is I'd like to break this verse down for us, and we want to kind of take it apart a little bit, being transformed into his image. First of all, it says, we all, meaning, it doesn't mean that he's from the south, where he says, y'all. What it does mean is that it speaks to every Christian, every believer, this manner of transformation is for every follower of Christ. Then it says, we all with unveiled face, meaning that the veil has been removed. There's nothing to hinder any longer. Look, if you will, down in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I just want to show you this. He says in verse 3, but if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those that are perishing. Here's the veil that it's referring to. See, the world doesn't know about the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's like a veil is over their eyes. But what Paul says here is if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Why is it veiled? It says whose minds the God of this age has blinded who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. And then he says, For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus. We preach Christ Jesus, that man in the glory, Christ Jesus. And I don't know if I've said this already or not, but I'll say it now. Whenever you see in Scripture... Christ Jesus, it's almost always pointing you to the man in the glory, where the he is now. 
Whenever you see Jesus Christ, it's pointing you to his manhood as he walked here in this scene. It's very helpful to know because what he's saying here is that our resource and our strength for living a transformed life comes from getting our eyes focused on the man in the glory, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says here, for we do not preach ourselves, but we preach that man in the glory, Christ Jesus, the Lord, and ourselves as bondservants for Jesus' sake. Then he says in verse 6, for it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So what he's telling us here is that when you and I are occupied with Christ, the glory of God, as it shines in the face of Jesus Christ, we see that glory, and that glory transforms us. Coming back to our verse in verse 18. That glory then, God wants that glory, the glory of God that shines in the face of Jesus Christ. When we look out at him, when we look at the Lord Jesus, that glory begins to do a work in our lives. It starts to transform us. When we see him on the pages of scripture, there starts to be a change. This is really what he's saying. So then we come back to the context of chapter 3. And I just want to give us quickly the context of chapter 3. The contrast, the contrast that is being set forth for us is that of Moses. You remember Moses, he went up into the mountain. And as Moses went up in the mountain and spoke with God, the glory of God was so magnificent. The glory of God was, was so superb. The glory of God was so awesome in the right sense of that word. And Moses came out. Moses didn't even realize it. He comes off the mountain and he comes to the people and the glory of God is shining. I know a brother that calls it the glory glow. And it's just shining forth out of Moses. And Moses, having been with God on the mountain, comes out and, and it's obvious he had been with God. And the people said, Moses, Moses you got to cover up. It's too much. Veil your face. And so Moses puts on this, this veil. And so there's a, a limitation. And the, the people of God that Moses served, the people of God that God used Moses to lead, they couldn't get it. Moses had been in the presence of God. But notice he says, we all, with unveiled face, this reminds us that that veil has been, been removed. That veil that Satan wants to blind our eyes and keep us from seeing the Lord Jesus Christ. That veil has been removed. And what we have is we have access into the presence of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And Hebrews chapter 2 says in verse 9, but we see Jesus. By the third, you have a right eye, you have a left eye, but you also have a third eye. And that third eye is the eye of faith. The believer has the eye of faith. And by faith, we look up and we see the Lord Jesus Christ crowned with glory and honor. And we see him there at the right hand of the majesty on high. Notice this. He says, beholding us in a mirror. James chapter 1, verse 23 and 24, remind us that the word of God is like a mirror. We don't want to be like that guy that looks in the mirror and sees himself for what he is and then walks away and forgets all about it. But the word of God is like a mirror. And yes, it reveals to us what we're like, but it also reveals what Christ is like. 
And how important it is that we look in the scripture, beholding us in the mirror. And uh, we're told in Hebrews chapter 3, I'll just read that verse very quickly. Hebrews chapter 3 says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. And so there we have this idea, of this is who we want to behold. Consider, he's the apostle. Apostle means sent one. Over and over again in the Gospel of John, we hear the Lord Jesus said that I come out from my Father. The Father has sent me. Over and over again, the Lord Jesus is seen as that sent one. And this idea of consider the apostle, it really connects to chapter 1 of Hebrews where it says that God has spoken in, in different ways in the times past through the fathers by the prophets. But in these last days has spoken to us sunwise. His son. God wants us to see his son. God has spoken to us. And so the writer of Hebrews says, listen, consider the apostle. But then he says, not only is he the apostle, the sent one out of God's presence into our lives, but also he is the high priest. And that brings us into chapter 2 of Hebrews. So chapter 3, verse 1, is really the bridge to connect chapter 1 and 2 together to chapter 3 to show us that, yes, he's the Son of God. He's the one in whom God has now spoken through in these last days to us. And he wants us to see his, the greatness of his beloved Son. And there's, I'll just tell you this. Here's a little homework, if you don't mind. In, in chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3, just three verses. There are seven glories of the Lord Jesus. Seven beautiful attributes of the Lord Jesus Christ that you can look at. Dig those out. If you need help, find Hamilton Smith's little booklet on Hebrews. He lists them there. But they are beautiful. And that's what the Lord wants us to see. That's what the Father wants us to see concerning His Son. Then, he says, not only this, but he is the high priest. He is that high priest. And he became a man so that he could be the high priest. He became a man and took on the likeness of men so that he could be, it says in Hebrews 2, 17, a faithful high priest in the things that pertain to God. So first of all, he's the high priest in the things that pertain to God. He met God's demands as a high priest. He offered the offering that God was satisfied with as the high priest. That was the offering of himself. So he is the high priest in the things concerning God. Now you say, well, Tim, okay, that's all fine, but what does this have to do? Listen, this is what God wants us to see. God wants us to be occupied with his son on the pages of scripture. And he wants us to, to, to lay aside some of the things in this world and really get into this book that we're talking about and behold his son. That's what he wants. And I tell you, when you put God first and you put Christ first in your life, I'm going to tell you something, young people. The greater your vision of Christ the less chance you will compromise in the things of Christ. The greater your vision of Christ, the less chance you will have in compromising the things of Christ. That's why we make much of Christ. He's my Savior. He died for me. This manner of transformation... It's my reasonable service. It only makes sense because I'm not my own anymore. You'll be holding us in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. We have access into the presence of God. You know, I remember one time when I lived in the Caribbean 
as a missionary, I remember uh, I came back from town. I was in, in the capital, Basatir, and I w- had some business at the capital building. And I came back, and, and the people in the village says, where have you been, Brother Tim? And I said, well, I was, I was in town. What were you doing? Well, I had to go to, to the Capitol building. Oh, did you have an appointment there? Yeah, I had an appointment. Who'd you have an appointment with? Kind of nosy, aren't they? Anyway, I said, well, I had an appointment with the president of our country? I said, yeah. You were in the president's office? I said, yeah. Wow, that's special. I said, it ain't that special. He's just a man. They said, yeah, but he's the president. Nah, he's just a man. I said, you know what's really special? It's every single day I wake up and I enter into the presence of the God of the universe. I enter into the presence of this God who is my father. That is special. Are you kidding me? That is special. Everything else, I count as dumb, the Apostle Paul said. And so, the glory of the Lord. He says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 and 20, that you and I, 19 to 22, we enter into the presence of God and there's no limit. Listen to this. There is no limit to what we might see in his presence. He said, well, wait a minute, Tim. How, how, how is that possible? Because 1 Corinthians, sorry, it's, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. That should be corrected up there. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. And it says, I have not seen, ear has not heard, neither has the man entered into the thoughts of what God has in store for those. God desires for you and I to enter in to his thoughts, especially concerning his son. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, it says, listen to this, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit, for the spirit searches the deep things of God. You see, God wants us. God is thrilled. When I open the scriptures and I start to study and I want to see Christ, and every time I say, every time I open this book, I speak to the author and I say to the author, please open my eyes that I might see the wonderful things concerning your beloved son and how good he is. I got to tell you something. I've been serving the Lord now for 40 years. And the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. There's nothing like the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's no one like the Lord Jesus Christ to be able to behold his glory day in and day out. To be able to To see on the pages of scripture, Psalm 34, verse 5, it says this. The psalmist first says, listen to this. The psalmist first says in verse 3, oh, I can't do that. Go to verse 1, sorry. Verse 1, I will bless the Lord. In other words, I will speak, I will speak well of the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Now listen to this. They they looked to him and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. That's what being transformed into the glory of God will give you. Listen, you want boldness? 
You want boldness to stand against compromise? You want boldness to, to stand against this world that is in complete, total opposition to the Lord Jesus Christ? You want boldness to be able to stand in school and, and against all the things that you're bombarded with? You look to the Lord. You see him on the pages of Scripture. And young people, I tell you, when you stand for Christ, he will stand for you. And I'm going to give you an example of that in just a moment. But I'll tell you this story first. There was a, this is a true story. There was a young man in college. And his professor was a known atheist. And this young man could have opted out of this class. He could have asked for another professor. That wasn't so hard on Christians. But he decided that I'm going to take this class. He's a good teacher. Even though he's an atheist, I'm going to take the class. So he took the class. And the, athe the, the atheist professor, he said, at one point in the school year, he decided to challenge anybody that's a Christian in the room. And the professor said, who here believes in God? A couple people raised their hand. And this young man raised his hand. And they said, he, the professor, the atheist said, well, I've got this beaker, this test tube here. And he held hold it up. It's a glass beaker, glass test tube. And he held it up. And he said, now, I'm going to let this go. And it's going to hit this floor, this concrete floor. And it's going to shatter into a gazillion pieces. Now, if you really believe in God, you can believe that God will keep this from breaking. One young man in the class, not the one we're talking about, but another one, he decided he was a Christian and, and he said, well, I believe that I, I, I don't, I believe that God could stop it. And the professor let it go and it landed on the ground and shattered into pieces. The young man was humiliated. The professor made fun of him. And that's what this man was facing. That's what this, our young man was facing. And so he went home. And the professor, the next week, starts the class the same way. Same challenge. And over the weekend, this young man had began to pray. He said, Lord, I don't want to compromise. I don't want to be quiet and pretend like I'm not a Christian. But I got to tell you, Lord, I need boldness to stand up to this professor. And so class came. The young man saw in scripture over the weekend how the Lord was with Daniel how the Lord was with different ones throughout Scripture. And he says, I want to be brave. I want to be bold. I want to stand for Christ the way they stood for God. And as he went through the book of Daniel, he saw Daniel. He saw Daniel's three friends. Then he saw Daniel again in the lion's den. And he said, Lord, as you were with them, you can be with me. You are a God that proved yourself when, when David went up against Goliath. And Lord, I'm facing a Goliath today. I need you to show that you are greater than this Goliath. The boy went to class. The young man went to class. The professor holds the beaker up. And the boy says, Sir, yes, I believe in God, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Sir, before you let that go, could I pray? The professor laughed at him and said, yeah, you can pray. You can do whatever you want. It's going to break like it always has broken. And the young man prayed. And he said, God, for your glory, I'm standing here today. 
I am not going to compromise my belief. And I know that you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I ask or think. I know that you're able to keep this beaker from breaking. Lord, in Jesus' name and for his glory, keep this from breaking. Amen. The professor says, you done yet? The professor holds it up. And he lets go. But this time, the beaker, the top of the beaker, hooked onto the professor's finger and went sideways. And the beaker came, fell on the professor's toe, and rolled off and didn't break. And the crowd, the, 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 all the other students, just went wild. This guy was finally beaten, right? And the young man says, wait, I want to pray. He gave the Lord the glory for helping him not to compromise. Because he saw on the pages of Scripture the glory of God. Young people, that can be you. Each one of us are faced with stuff all of our life. But we need to be like this young man. And we need to be transformed like this young man. We're being transformed, being changed from the inside out, as we have already said. And so what we find, again, being transformed into his image, into that same image, our verse says, according to what he is doing in our life. He is bringing many sons to glory. And so as he's bringing many sons to glory in the book of Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10, he's bringing many sons to glory. And what he's doing is he's transforming them. He's transforming each one of us to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. He's molding us and shaping us. He may allow us to go through things so that he can perfect the product so that we can be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. We're being changed into the same image. What a verse. One day we will look like him. We will see him as he is. And we will be like him, Scripture says. It will have its full work accomplished. And we'll be like Christ. From glory to glory. That's an interesting phrase to figure out what that means. And what it means is that from one degree to the other degree. In other words, today, you may not be what you ought to be, but you were not what you were yesterday. But you are not what you can be tomorrow. From glory to glory, our God wants to change us from the inside out. The Spirit of God is working on the inside. And He wants to mold us and shape us and, and to change us from one degree to another. It's an ongoing process, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. It is a work of the Spirit through the Word of God, as we've said you know, when we have the transforming power of the Spirit of God, I want to just give you an illustration of this. We've been looking at the, the caterpillar to a moth, or to a butterfly, right? You could look at a, the, the tadpole to a, to a little frog. Another good example of that work of transformation. But here's one for you. I was reading this in a book that I have. And I found it to be absolutely fascinating. And it's the, the fact that if you've ever seen a piece of petrified wood, when I was a kid, I used to have this piece of petrified wood. For some reason, I thought it was really cool to find skeleton heads uh, of little animals. I don't know, I'm warped, sorry. And I would put them on the petrified wood, right? And that was in my room. My mom would have to dust around that all the time. That's another story. But this petrified wood, it used to be wood. 
but now it's stone. You know how it happened? When wood gets buried and it gets saturated with water and the water goes inside the wood and the water begins this process and it's through that process that this piece of wood becomes petrified, meaning that it becomes stone. It goes from being one thing to being another thing, just like the caterpillar to the butterfly, just like the tadpole to the frog. And, and this stone that once was a piece of wood, I mean, my piece that I had was very heavy. And if it dropped on your foot, you felt it. I know that because that happened to me once. And so, but, but the point I want to make is that it's the water that comes in and is saturated and, and comes and fully absorbed in that wood and, and, and that process of decay and everything else that takes place. That process changes that wood into stone. The illustration is simple. The water can either, either represent the Word of God, as you and I are in the Word, then the Word goes into us, and the Word starts to transform us. Or that water could represent the Holy Spirit, and in Scripture, water that is still often represents the Word of God, and in Scripture, water that is moving often represents the Holy Spirit. And so, either way we take this illustration, we find that I'd like to suggest it's both. The Holy Spirit takes the Word of God and transforms us, as we have said. And so, let me show you what the Holy Spirit can do in your life. How the Holy Spirit can transform you in your life. And there are a couple of things here that we can look at. The first thing is that he is able to turn your fear into boldness. He's able to turn your fear into boldness. He's able to take your anxiety into peace. He's able to make your stress into joy. He's able to take your doubt and make it into unshakable faith. He's able to take your, the love of self and help you to love others. I remember 40 years ago, I asked Brother Grant Steidel, I asked him, how do you become a good servant of the Lord? And he said, I said, I, you know, how is it that you can be a good, faithful servant? He said, Tim, there's two things. Never forgot what he said. He said, ask the Lord every day for a love for his word and a love for the people of God every day. I've been doing that every day for 40 years. I wake up in the morning and my first prayer is, Lord, give me a love for your word and give me a love for your people. This can only happen through the Holy Spirit. Next, we find that he gives us a desire for personal uh, he takes away the desire for personal advancement and he changes that into a desire for kingdom advancement to advance the kingdom of God here in this scene. That it's not by picketing and it's not by this, but it's by living out the, the characteristics, the beatitudes, the things that are given to us in Scripture. It's by living those things out in a very real way. And so... He gives us a, it takes away the desire for personal advancement, climbing up that, that ladder, climbing up that, one man said, I, I spent all my life climbing the corporate ladder only to find out it was leaning on the wrong wall. What a miserable life. But when you put Christ first and you put your desire to be transformed into his image first and foremost, young people, God is no man's debtor. And if you don't compromise and you live a life of no compromise, 
How wonderful. He takes the strongholds and tears them down. The strongholds that the enemy builds up in our lives. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. He takes those, verse 3 to 5, he takes those strongholds down. Brings us to a place of freedom. He changes defeat into victory. Those, he helps those who, who are hiding and he helps them to go public with their Christian faith. And so as we think about this then, the key really to these two verses that we've been looking at this week, where he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable God, which is a reasonable service. Do not be conformed in the... In, in, do not let the world conform you or squeeze you into its world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might be able to prove what is the good and acceptable, perfect will of God. And then secondly, but we all with unveiled face, beholding us in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory as by the Spirit of the Lord. As you look at those two, two verses, what I've got up here, is that both of these verses underline one important key to any of us being transformed into the image of Christ, and that is surrender. Surrender. Lord, from this moment, my life's not my life. I surrender it to you. Lord, I want you to have your way in my life. And the more serious you are about this, the more serious he'll take you up on it. I surrendered my life to the Lord for full-time service when I was 13 at a revival meeting. You know what happened after that? The devil through my flesh, of course, but the devil took me for a ride for three years. I fell so far away from the Lord, I went forward in a meeting, and the devil says, oh yeah, you mean business with God? I mean business with you. And the devil took me away from the Lord from the time I was 13 to the time I was 16. And I'm not going to tell you what, what that life was like because number one I'm ashamed of it and number two it's none of your business that's between me and my Lord but you need to know and I'm not gonna whitewash this I'm gonna tell you you need to know that if you mean business with the Lord you come on the front lines of the devil's attack but I'm also here to tell you that when I was 16, the Lord arrested my heart, my attention. That's a whole nother experience. I'm not going to take time to tell you about it. I'll just say I was at a place I shouldn't have been. And, well, all right. I took a key stick up a guy's, upside a guy's head. And then I realized that there was more his friends than my friends. So I skedaddled out of there quick, and I walked, uh, I was walking on the road, and I, I realized they might be coming after me, so I went into the woods, and as I got into the woods, I, it was dark, it was about three o'clock in the morning, and I got lost, and as I was wandering around in the woods, I came to a point that I said, Lord, and the Lord reminded me, you gave your life to serve me when you were 13. What, what's up with that? What happened? I bowed on my knees in the middle of the woods. And I said, Lord, I belong to you. Please forgive me. Cleanse me so that you can use me. 
And if you get me out of these woods, I'll serve you for the rest of my life. So I got up. I had a sense of peace that flooded my soul, my heart. I got up, and I kid you not, one, two, and I'm out on pavement. The road was that close to me. And while I was there wandering around, not one car came by. As soon as I stepped on the road, here comes a car. So I called him down and got in his car and he took me home. But as soon as I stepped on, on the road, I said, uh-oh. I just surrendered to the Lord. This time, I've got to fulfill it with no turning back. And young people, you can't compromise when you're talking about this transforming work. You have to stand for the Lord. And so as we think about this then, I want to just close briefly with giving you two examples. One of Stephen and one of the Apostle Paul himself. We know these stories, so I'm not going to take all the time uh, that is needed to develop them. Just simply say, in Acts chapter 7, we find Stephen is talking about, it's interesting to see at the beginning of the chapter, he is talking about the God of glory. At the end of the chapter, he is seeing the glory of God as it's in the face of Jesus Christ. And what's interesting about this you really have to go back to chapter 6, and you have to see in chapter 6 that Stephen was, uh, he was one of those men chosen, and they said, pick men that are full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, and then it says that Stephen, they choose Stephen, chapter 6, verse 5, they choose Stephen because he was a man full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit, down in verse 8, full of grace, and full of power. And then when you come to chapter 7, you read in chapter 7 where Stephen is now talking to the religious people of the day, to the Pharisees. And when they hear what Stephen had to say, they stop their ears. You can just imagine what they did. They stopped their ears. And not only did they stop their ears, it says they, they gnashed their teeth at him. They gnashed. I mean, that looks ugly, doesn't it? They gnashed their teeth at him. And notice what it says about Stephen. Remember, Stephen was a man full, full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit, full of grace, full of power. And it says, but he, verse 55, but he being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed up into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now what I need to show you is in that phrase, he being filled. That word being, it means that he continued to be what he already was. He didn't just start that moment. He was already continuing being full of the Spirit full of faith, full of grace, full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit. And he continued to be that. And then it says, as they're gnashing their teeth at him, he's looking up into heaven. He started talking about the, the God of glory, but now he sees the glory of God as it's in the face. He says, he gazed up into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he looked and he says, look, I see the heavens open. By the way, whenever you see the heavens open in the New Testament, it's always connected to the person of Christ. It's always so that we can see Christ. And so he says, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. This is what he sees. <laughs> and he says, it says that they cried out with a loud voice and they stopped their ears and they ran at him with one accord. They wouldn't have anything to do with it. 
And so Stephen says, okay, hold on, guys. Wait a minute. Let, let's, let's compromise here. No, not at all. What Stephen does, it says, as they're running at him in one accord, and they cast him out of the city, and they picked up stones, and they stoned him. And, as he, and, and witnesses laid down their coats at this young man named Saul. Saul of Tarsus, verse 59. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God. Let me show you something. It says he was calling on God. And who did he address? Lord Jesus. For those friends of yours that might not believe that Jesus is God, Stephen was facing death. He wasn't fooling around. He called on God and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice. Listen to what he cried out. Remember, he's being transformed. He sees the glory of God as it's shining in the face of Jesus Christ. He sees the Lord Jesus standing for him. There the Lord Jesus is standing for him. And he sees the Son of God standing for him. And he says, as he's being, looking at this vision, beholding the glory of the Lord, he says, Lord Jesus, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. Do not charge them with this sin. Well, who does that sound like but the Lord Jesus Christ, who from the cross, after he had been beaten, after his beard had been plucked out, after his back had been scourged, after they pierced him in the hand, nailed him to that cross, and nailed his feet to that cross, hanging there almost naked, My Lord looked at the, at the crowd. And my Savior said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. And Stephen, Stephen says, Lord, as he's being transformed into the image of Christ, being like Christ, he says, Lord, don't lay this charge. Oh, how that must have thrilled the heart of the Savior. And he says, I don't know if he said it or not, but the fact that Stephen fell asleep in Jesus proves to me, he did say it, that his heart was full of joy, that here is one that was transformed into his image. Wow. So, Saul, all these coats at Saul's feet. Young man Saul, this, this zealous Pharisee, a Pharisee of Pharisees, born of the right tribe, a, a member of the Sanhedrin, top dog. I mean, he was it. He gets letters, and he says, well, that's, that's one. We got Stephen done. That's one. But you know something I think? I'm not sure I can prove this from Scripture, but I believe it in my heart. I don't think Saul of Tarsus ever lost sight of Stephen calling on his Lord. I don't think that incident ever left Saul, I think he was bound to be a changed man because of it. And I think that that obstacle for Stephen became God's opportunity for Saul. And many times our opportunities are 
what we might think to be obstacles, but God wants to use them as opportunities to glorify for you in your life to glorify him. And so what we find with Saul then when we turn to chapter 9, we saw Saul has letters. Right? He has permission. He has written authority to go and to persecute any Christian, any person that he found in the way, which means it's one of those words that the Lord Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The early, the early believers were called people of the way. You find this through the New Testament through the book of Acts especially. And so Paul says, uh, Saul says, anybody I find that's in the way, that's following this Jesus, I'm going to take them, I'm going to persecute them, and I'm going to throw them into prison. And if they die along the way, that's okay too. I mean, that was his, his attitude. When you read in 2 Timothy chapter 1, and you read that Paul says he was an insolent man, that means that he was a violent man. He didn't care. He didn't care. And on the road to Damascus, he has these letters, this authority. And along the way, the Lord, the Lord stops Saul in his tracks. And what happens along the way is that this light, and you know that's the beautiful thing, when you tell your testimony, Here's a clue. If you tell your testimony of what Jesus has done for you, you ought to grow smaller and smaller and smaller. And he ought to grow bigger, bigger, and bigger. And that's what happened to Saul. Because in Acts chapter 9, we see that there was this light, this bright light, and Saul is struck down by this bright light. But in chapter 22, when when Saul tells the story, he, he says it was, a, it was a bright light. He describes it. And then in chapter 26, when he says it again, he says it was a brighter light that outshined the noonday sun. This light was so bright. You see, what Saul does is every time he tells the story, Christ becomes greater and greater and greater because his understanding of who Christ is grew and his transformation, being like Christ, grows. So Paul saw at this point, the Lord speaks to him. Those that were with him didn't, didn't, they heard the noise, they didn't recognize the voice. And Saul says, and the voice says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul says, well, who art thou, Lord? He says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, Stop for a minute and think. Was he really persecuting Jesus? No. But yes. See, the Lord Jesus says, when you touch one of mine, you touch me. The Lord Jesus says, he is the head of the church, and the church is his body. This is something Saul, when he becomes Paul, this is what he begins to teach. Where do we get body truth from? We get it from Paul. Where do we get the truth of lordship? We get it from Paul. Where do we get the truth of grace, the grace of God? We get it from Paul. Where do we get the truth of of, uh, uh, Christ being the head? We get that from Paul. Where do we get the truth of grace? We get it from Paul. Where do we get this truth of transformation? Romans 12, 1 and 2. 2 Corinthians 3.18, we get it from Paul. And what happened is Paul, he sees this bright light. His life was forever changed. He says, well, okay, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. What do you want me to do? That was his next words. What do you want me to do? There was surrender. There was surrender. On the spot. And Saul was taken uh, into the city. He goes to a place. He, the first thing we find about Paul as Saul, the first thing he does uh, in his conversion is it says that the Lord told another man, Ananias, to go 
He says, go down this street called Straight. You're going to find Saul there. And you know what he's doing? He's praying. He's praying. And then Ananias goes up to him. Listen to this. Ananias goes up to him. And at first, Ananias was a little bit trepidatious because he heard about this man, Saul. He knew that Saul was a persecutor. He knew that Paul was, Saul was a violent man. But he goes up to him anyway because God says so. God says, listen, he's my chosen vessel. And he's going to suffer many things for me. But he's my chosen vessel. Ananias goes to him. Do you know what the first words Ananias says to him was? Brother Saul. Are you kidding me? That guy was a persecutor. That guy was an insolent man. That guy was violent. That guy sanctioned Stephen's death. Brother Saul. Why? Because there was new birth. Why? Because there had begun the process of transformation in Saul. And as you read through scripture, you see that his life was indeed transformed. And so I say all of this to say to you, the hands that are holding you are the hands that mold you. Scripture says that we are being held by those hands. That no man can pluck us out of those hands. The Father who's greater than all has us in his hand. But another illustration given to us in two places in the Old Testament, at least two places, is that he is the potter, that we are the clay. And he's molding us. He's shaping us. He's the hands that hold us, but he's the hands that mold us. Sometimes as a potter, I took a pottery class just so I could understand pottery. <laughs> just so I could understand this illustration. One time, years ago, I took this pottery class. And she told me, the, the, the instructor, she told me, listen, you, you got to put more pressure if you want to shape this the way you want it. And I said, but if I put pressure, I might push too hard and I might break it. Then you start over. But you have to put pressure in order for it to be shaped. Sometimes the potter, the master potter, puts pressure in our lives. It may not feel comfortable at the moment, in fact, it may hurt, but that's when we trust him and we say, Lord, use this experience to transform me. Use this experience to mold me. Use this experience to make me more like the Lord Jesus. One experience in my life, at one time, one of the hardest things I ever went through in my life. I told the Lord I didn't like it, but if he wanted me to go through it, he needed to give me the grace to endure it. And he did. He's the master potter. He holds you and he molds you. But you have to be pliable in his hand. You have to say, Lord, I'm yours. Transform me. I want to be in your word. And as you're in the word of God, the Spirit of God will take the Word of God and mold you into the image of the Son of God so that your life can bring glory to God. May it be so for His name's sake.